Okay, class, moving along, we're going to chapter four, tissues. So a whole bunch of cells, you put a whole bunch of cells together and you make tissues, or so moving right along. Let's look at some fun facts about the body first. Um, did you know for every pound of fat that you gain, you add seven miles of new blood vessels? Crazy, right? New tissue needs blood supply, so your vascular system expands to accommodate it. This also means your heart must work harder to pump blood through the new network, which may reduce oxygenation and nutrient replenishment in other tissues. Lose a pound? Guess what? Your body will break down and reabsorb the unneeded blood vessels from the previous tissue. So, muscle tissue is three times more efficient at burning calories than fat. This is why possessing more muscle should be a training goal for most people. More muscle equals more calories burned equals less fat equals more fit looking. Simple goals, simple math. You're taller in the morning in the e than in the evening. Do you know that? When you crawl out of the sack in the morning, you're at your tallest. So you should measure yourself uh, then. Those that are 4'10", you may be 4'11". <laughs> On average, you are approximately one half inch taller when you wake up in the morning thanks to excess fluid between your spinal discs. Yes, as you sit all day, as you walk all day, you lose fluid in those discs. While you're sleeping, these fluids replenish. Some of you students never sleep, so there you'll always be short. During the day, your body has to deal with the stress of standing, so the discs become compressed and the fluid seeps out. This results in you losing a small amount of extra height. And your stomach manufactures a new lining every three days to avoid digesting itself. As part of the digestive process, your stomach secretes hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is a powerful corrosive compound also used to treat various metals. The hydrochloric acid your stomach secretes is so powerful, but the mucus lining the stomach wall has keeps it within the digestive system so you don't burn a hole in your stomach. As a result, it breaks down the food you consume, but not your own stomach. Now, there's four types of tissues, and we'll talk about each one, each section. There's epithelial tissue, which is composed of layers of closely spaced cells that cover organ surfaces or form glands. Now, epithelial tissue is usually used for protection, secretion, and absorption. Okay. Where can you find epithelial tissues? Well, it's usually the epidermis inner lining of the digestive tract, liver, and other glands. Connective tissue, which is probably what you injure the most, that's tissue with usually more matrix than cell volume, often specialized to support, bind, and protect organs. So those are your tendons, ligaments, cartilage, bone, blood, and lymph. Like I said, those are the uh, connective tissue is what you injure most often. Now there's nervous tissue, that's tissue containing excitable cells specialized for rapid transmission of information to the other cells. That would be your brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And then of course you know about muscular tissue, tissue composed of elongated excitable cells specialized for contraction. Uh, the other types or other types of muscular tissue, you've got the skeletal muscle, which is voluntary, meaning you can move it, the heart, which is cardiac muscle, which is involuntary, and then you've got the walls of the viscera, which is smooth muscle, which is also involuntary, meaning you can't control it. You don't have to tell your heart to beat, it just automatically does it. You don't have to tell the walls of your viscera, which is your GI tract, to actually say, hey, digest. It does it automatically, it's involuntary. But you can tell, say, hey, let me flex this biceps while this person walks by, then of course, yes, that is voluntary control. So we'll talk more in depth as the lecture goes on. Here's a nice little uh, uh, diagram. Uh, this figure is a view of the regular architect of normal tissue contrasted to the irregular arrangement of cancerous cells. So here's abnormal epithelium and here's normal. Like I told you the theme of the semester, if you know what normal looks like, then when you look at it in a microscope and you're like, oh, that's not normal. So you almost need to learn normal first so you can detect abnormal. And this is using a microscope. So well, most tissues you need to use some sort of microscope in order to see. You're not able to see the detail with the naked eye. Now the four types of tissues that will go in depth again there's nervous tissue, brain, spinal cord, nerves, muscular tissue which is cardiac smooth and muscle, connective tissue which is fat, 
bone, tendon, and guess what? Blood is also connective tissue. Might be a good quiz question. And then epithelia, which is the lining of the GI tracts, lining of hollow organs, and the skin surface. And again, we'll break each one down and talk more about them. Where do all these tissues give rise to? Guess what? They give rise from these three germ layers. And when we do embryonic development, we'll talk more about that. But that's ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm. So from the ectoderm, you get the epidermis, glands of skin, some cranial bones, pituitary, the nervous system, the mouth between cheek and gums, and the anus. That comes from the ectoderm. Again, skin cells, neurons, and pigment cell. The mesoderm, which is connective tissue proper, you're going to get your bones, cartilage, blood, endothelium or blood vessels, muscle, synovial, serous membranes, lining body cavities, kidneys, and lining of the gonads. So that arises from the mesoderm. So what arises from the endoderm? You've got the lining of airways and digestive system except the mouth and the distal part of the uh, digestive system, which is the rectum and the anal canal. Glands, such as digestive glands, endocrine glands, and the adrenal cortex, all come from the endoderm. So make sure you know what tissue arises from what germ layer, because those are great uh, quiz questions as well. Now, let's look at epithelial tissue first. What are the characteristics? It's got usually one or more layers. It's closely adhere cells, so they're real close together. They form surfaces. They're avascular, meaning the very least blood supply of epithelial tissue. So you have a basement membrane and then you have basal and apical surfaces. So these are good characteristics. So good, uh, the way I could ask this on a quiz would be all the following are characteristics of epithelial tissue except, right? And I might put vascular in there or something like that, right? That's just an example. All right. The cells of the epithelial, they have different shapes. They have a squamous shape, which Okay, and simple means one layer, stratified means more than one layer. So if you have something that's simple squamous, it should look like that. If it says stratified squamous, it should look something like this. Now if you have simple cuboidal, those are cube shaped, and they'll have one layer, so a simple cuboidal looks like that. You have stratified cuboidal, which has more than one layer. Okay. Then you have simple columnar, which is more rectangular shaped. You have stratified columnar, which is more than one layer. But then you have pseudo, pseudo meaning fake. So it looks stratified, meaning it kind of looks like it has two layers, but really it's just one layer. And those are called pseudo stratified, and that's found in the respiratory tract. And uh, we'll talk about that some more as well. So let's talk about the first epithelium it's simple squamous epithelium so when you study these you want to say okay what is the name where is it found what does it do and what does it look like so those are the flashcards you make that's how you study so first let's say simple squamous epithelium where is it found it's found in the air sacs of lungs kidney tubules the serous membranes of the stomach and intestines well, why is it designed that way? What does it allow it to do? It allows for rapid diffusion or transport of substances. Okay, so if you go back to the here, we like, yes, we need rapid diffusion in the lungs. Yes, we need rapid diffusion in kidneys. Yes, we need rapid diffusion in the stomach and intestines. So it makes sense why we have this tissue here. So you always want to make sense. And remember the theory behind it. Now let's look at simple cuboidal. That's found in the liver, thyroid, mammary, salivary, and other glands, and in the kidney tubules. What does it do? It allows for absorption and secretion. So yes, the kidney needs to absorb and secrete. The thyroid gland, the liver, needs to absorb and secrete. So it makes sense why that is. Okay, so that's how you study these tissues. Name it. Where is it found? What does it do? And what does it look like? Remember, simple, meaning one layer, cuboidal meaning square shape or cube shaped makes perfect sense now you have simple columnar where is that found that's found in the inner lining of the stomach intestines gallbladder the uterus what does it allow it to do it allows for absorption and secretion of mucus so if you look at these little goblet cells goblet cells right in here 
that allows for the secretion of mucus. Do you need mucus in the stomach? Yes. So it doesn't eat itself. Do you need mucus in the intestines? Yes. Mucus in the gallbladder and the uterus. There you go. So, makes sense. Now, pseudostratify, this is one of my favorite tissues, because it looks like it's got more than one layer, but really it's not. It's just one layer. And where is it found? It's found in the respiratory tract and the male urethra. It allows and secretes and propels mucus. All right. Now, how many of you smoke? Uh, let me rephrase that. How many of you smoke uh, cigarettes? I know. These days I have to be very specific. <clears throat> but the reason I tell you that is if you smoke, what the nicotine does is it paralyzes these little cilia. You know, you wake up every morning and you got <clears throat> kind of have to clear your throat. And what that is, is the cilia is bringing the mucus out of your respiratory tract to clear your lungs. Now, here's something you probably didn't know, but you sneeze to clear your upper respiratory tract and you cough to clear your lower respiratory tract. There you go. Fun facts for the day. <laughs> All right. So when you smoke and this is paralyzed, you can't clear your lungs and the mucus gets trapped in there. So that's why anybody uh, that has a family member that has been smoking for a while, you hear that nasty cough because they're trying to clear their lungs because their cilia, we call it the mucociliary elevator, does not really work too well. So there you go. That's why you should never smoke. There you go. Here's more evidence. Here's what nice healthy lungs look like. Here's what a smoker's lungs looks like. Nasty. Now, if you do smoke, it's never too late to stop. Here's the healing timeline of when you quit smoking. So 20 minutes after you quit, guess what? Your blood pressure is going to go down. Eight hours after you quit, the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood drops back to normal while oxygen increases to normal. 48 hours after you quit, your nerve endings start to regenerate and you can smell and taste things better. One to nine months. Now, this is the variance. Coughing, sinus congestions, fatigue, and shortness of breath usually go down. Some of you, depending on how much you smoke, it could be nine months to a year. But roughly one year, the added risk of heart disease declines to half of that of a smoker. After five years of smoke, uh, quitting, your stroke risk may be reduced to that of someone who's never smoked. So five years, 10 years, your risk of all smoking related cancers, such as lung, mouth, and throat decreases by 50%. And 15 years after your last cigarette, your risk of heart disease and smoking related death is now similar to the, of someone that's never, ever smoked. Okay. This is from the American Lung Association. So there you go. I know uh, it sounds like a long time frame, but if you uh, uh, quit after 15 years, you'll be back to normal. <laughs> The best thing to do is never start in the first place. All right, now, moving on to more epithelium, you've got stratified squamous epithelium, which is keratinized, and we'll talk about what keratinized means. That, that's found in the epidermis, palms, and soles. Okay, it resists abrasion. So anytime you have anything that is keratinized, it's going to resist abrasion, it's going to retard water loss, and it's going to resist penetration of organisms. So we like keratinized stratified squamous. Okay. That's usually found in the palms and soles right here. Now, you have stratified squamous epithelium that's non-keratinized. That's found in the tongue, esophagus, anal canal, and vagina. It still resists abrasion and prevents pathogenic organisms. So the stratified squamous, even though it's non-keratinized, it still resists abrasion and prevents pathogenic organisms, which is found in the tongue, esophagus, anal canal, and vagina. So make sure you know the difference between keratinized, which is prevents water loss. It's found in the palms and soles. Okay. And then non-keratinized, which resists abrasion. Now you have stratified cuboidals. Remember, stratified meaning more than one layer. Cuboidal meaning square or cube shaped. That's found in your sweat glands and it contributes to sweat secretion. Remember how we release heat? We need to sweat. I'll give you that example of the cheetah. Now you have transitional epithelium, which is found in your urinary tract. Why is this? 
Okay, well, it protects tissue from osmotic and acidic effects of urine and stretches to hold more pee. So it gives you that flexibility to say, hey, you know what, Patel, I can't go to the bathroom right now, so guess what? My transitional epithelium is working uh, really hard here. Okay, there you go. So now you understand why these tissues are designed and how they can adapt to the everyday demands of humans. Okay.